Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away. Tonight, a candid description of Alberta's ICUs from a man who just survived one. They asked if it comes down to it, do you want to live or die? Plus, warnings about how much worse things could get. Also tonight, Annamie Paul delivers a sizzling resignation speech. What I didn't realize at the time is that I was breaking a glass ceiling that was going to fall on my head. The UK has a gas crisis. Chris Brown explains why. So a lot of the drivers in this queue are going to be pretty disappointed when they finally get up to the pump. And up for auction, newly discovered interviews from 50 years ago. What Beatle music do you look upon as being outstanding? A Canadian's chats with John Lennon. This is The National. The message is familiar, but for Alberta ICU doctors, it needs repeating, and an open letter underlined their warning. The system is on the verge of collapse. More than 1,000 in hospitals, hundreds on ventilators, nurses running from patient to patient until they're run off their feet. The wave of daily new cases in Alberta for now appears to be cresting, but COVID hospitalizations are already at levels not seen in previous waves. As Aaron Collins explains, a key question now, how little it will take to send the system over the edge and how much more trouble could be coming. Intimate portraits of a life hanging by a thread. A candid peek inside Bernie Cook's days in a Calgary ICU. Time he'd like to forget, but knows he won't. They asked me if I wanted to be resuscitated. They said they asked if it comes down to it. Do you want to live or die? Home and on the men now, Cook says the ICU was full of COVID patients. He recalls one woman who came in as he was getting set to leave. And I knew. She's in for freaking hell. She's coming in for a journey. And I I'm not sure if she, that's my thoughts going in my head. I'm like, she might not make it. Similar stories are unfolding in ICUs across Alberta. Overcapacity and under-resourced doctors across the province urging the government to act now to prevent a catastrophe. We are in a position where we're right on the edge of the cliff. But I want to be able to know that there is a bed available for everyone that comes in who's critically ill. And I'm not sure that I can promise that if we continue on the path that we are in Alberta. Many doctors calling for a so-called firebreak lockdown to slow this fourth wave. Without one, some predict Alberta could need more than 700 ICU beds by December, more than double what's being used today. Hit the brake as hard as you can because the best indicator we have right now is hospitals. And the fact that hospitals are overwhelmed, we cannot afford to have more cases arriving to a hospital. Like most people in Alberta's ICUs, Bernie Cook was unvaccinated when he went in. Well, he's been immunized now and has a message for Albertans who aren't. Yeah, I mean, get, get vaccinated. I mean, it's, I, I would recommend it. So, Aaron, do we have any sense that the province is even considering a lockdown? Well, we know Jason Kenney doesn't like the idea. He's made that abundantly clear. But we have to remember that the Premier said this summer that the pandemic was over and that vaccine passports would never come to this province. So the Premier does change his mind. And as pressure mounts here during this fourth wave, it's not inconceivable that, well, he might change his mind again. All right, Aaron Collins in Calgary tonight. Thank you, Aaron. Per capita, the COVID crisis in Saskatchewan's hospitals is just as severe as Alberta's, and Canada's health minister says Ottawa stands ready to help. In an interview with Canadian Press, Patty Haidu said the surge in Saskatchewan is heartbreaking. Unlike Alberta, Haidu says Saskatchewan has not formally asked for federal assistance. Saskatchewan's health minister, meanwhile, says the province has adequate capacity to deal with the surge of patients. And New Brunswick reported a record-breaking 86 new cases today, adding to what is already a record-breaking surge in that province. A state of emergency was reimposed over the weekend, limiting close contacts and indoor gatherings. 39 people trapped in a valley mine near Sudbury, Ontario, are expected to reach the surface soon. They've been underground since Sunday when their elevator was damaged by a piece of equipment. To get out, they must now climb up a secondary system of ladders, about twice the height of the CN Tower. 
Valley says no one is injured and that the workers have had access to food, water and their medications. Exactly one week after the federal election and after months of party infighting, today Annamie Paul quit as Green Party leader. As David Thurton shows us, she left with blunt words for her opponents inside the party. On the way out of a job that had broken so many barriers, Annamie Paul says she's leaving with scars. What I didn't realize at the time is that I was breaking a glass ceiling that was going to fall on my head and leave a lot of shards of glass that I was going to have to crawl over, um, you know, throughout my time as a leader. Bye. Thanks so much for coming. Paul says she was set up for failure in the federal election, left without a national campaign director, adequate funding or staff. Then, even before ballots were counted, she says party brass were plotting to remove her. On the day of the election itself in the morning, uh, the only email that I received uh, from our council, from the president of our council, uh, was an email calling for an emergency meeting uh, to uh, launch a leadership review. Paul's executive assistant says the experiences shed light on anti-Semitism and systemic racism inside the Greens. I think that if this was a white person, even a white woman, um, things would have looked much differently and she would have been given a lot more support. Paul didn't take reporter questions, nor did she address what responsibility she takes after debates over the Middle East conflict nearly consumed the party last spring, pushing one of three Green MPs to the Liberals. And she didn't accept blame for the collapse of party support at the polls. Any leader in a political party that had these results, I think it's reasonable to expect some acceptance of some responsibility. Instead, Paul had a message for her opponents. You may take small comfort in this for a moment, but please know that there are many more people like me than there are you, and you will not succeed uh, in the end. Paul officially leaves in two weeks, unsure what's next, but hopeful whoever takes over will continue her quest for equity and justice. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. Elections Canada says the Liberal Party has requested a judicial recount in the tightly contested Quebec riding of Châteauguay la Colle. After two days of counting, the Bloc Québécois Patrick O'Hara was declared the winner, beating out Liberal incumbent Brenda Shanahan by less than 300 votes. Officials say since that vote was validated, a potential anomaly was reported concerning the results of a single ballot box. Next month, Manitoba's governing Progressive Conservative Party will pick a new leader and therefore Manitoba's new premier. It will be a historic vote, putting a woman in that premier's office for the first time. Cameron McIntosh with the candidates and the issue already playing big. Out of the gate first with the backing of caucus, Heather Stephenson looked poised to be acclaimed premier. But you know politics. Good way to start the day. <laughs> Plans can get tripped up. The former health minister now promising a better pandemic response. I have heard from countless Manitobans who are looking for a different approach. Suddenly up against an outside challenger. I'm going to be the next leader of the PC party in Manitoba. Yeah. And the next premier. Former federal conservative cabinet minister Shelley Glover, critic of the very government she wants to lead. I'm worried about the state of Manitoba. Either way, it's historic. 103 years after Manitoba became the first province to give women the right to vote, not one woman's portrait hangs here on the wall of premiers in the Manitoba legislature. This race will change that. Only two candidates, two women, which is unusual and kind of amazing. Both pledging change and healing after the resignation of Brian Pallister, criticized for his handling of the pandemic, and a leadership style which alienated many. The 19th member of the Premier's Club says this is a significant change. I think it'll be a great thing to have a, a, a woman Premier. In the race, vaccines are an early issue. Both candidates support COVID vaccines but have come out against mandates. Messages aimed at a vaccine skeptical faction that may have secured enough party memberships to decide the leadership. That's a hard position for both Heather Stephenson and Shelley Glover to be in. Whoever wins has two years before the next election to turn it all around. Against an opposition leader poised to make history of his own. In the next election, we are either going to have a woman premier or an indigenous premier. Either way, future pictures on the premier's wall could look different.
Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver were saluted at the United Nations General Assembly today. We are proud of the courage of our two citizens, the good faith and resilience of their families. Foreign Affairs Minister Mark Garneau also defended Canada's arrest of Meng Wanzhou at Washington's request, citing a commitment to international law. And today the White House noted the safe return of the two Canadians. We are still pleased to see, of course, uh, the release of the two Michaels, something we have been pressing for as, uh, as our uh, neighbours to the north have been pressing for. The White House maintains Meng Wanzhou's plea deal was unrelated to their release. Today, China's foreign ministry said the same thing, though in a sharper tone, accusing Canada of doing Washington's dirty work by arresting Meng in the first place. While the two Michaels adjust to normal life, a third Canadian remains trapped in China. Hussein Jalil, a Uyghur human rights activist, has been in prison since 2006. Katie Nicholson has his long-suffering family's message for Ottawa. Camila Tilindabaiva makes dinner for her four boys, alone as she has every night since her husband became a Chinese prisoner 15 years ago. Every day, every year, every month, you know, it's very stressful. It's awful. Her hopes buoyed briefly by the return of the two Michaels, replaced now by anger. Now it's my turn. Hussein Jalil and his young family were visiting relatives in Uzbekistan in 2006 when Chinese authorities requested police there pick him up. He was sent to China, which refused to acknowledge his Canadian citizenship. An outspoken Uyghur activist, Jalil was tried as a terrorist and sentenced to life in prison. Tilinda Baiva says Canada hasn't done enough. They are saying we tried, we tried all the avenues, all the streets, we tried this way, this way, this way. We are talking. The, your husband is, you know, top of the priority. We don't see any result. We, I haven't seen any result. I think they haven't done nothing, his case. Fareed Khan wonders if things would be different if Jalil were white. It seems uh, there's a racialized nature to the way that uh, uh, global affairs and the Canadian government deals with Canadian detainees overseas. It's our belief in democracy. The Harper government did publicly try to intervene, but Jalil's lawyer isn't impressed with this government's action on the case. I don't give the Trudeau government high marks to date. Minister of Foreign Affairs Mark Garneau wasn't taking questions today at the UN, but in a statement, his department said it is actively engaged on the case. And McLeod is optimistic. They have found success with the two Michaels, and I'm confident we can uh, pull and exercise all the levers that we did in that case on Hussein's. One day he's going to come back and then so we can continue the life together. A day she hopes is now closer at hand. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Burlington. Relations between Canada and China will have consequences for Meng's employer, tech giant Huawei itself. Here's Peter Armstrong on the ongoing trade relationship. It's time for the headlines. With Nick it wasn't Elliott that long ago that Huawei was front and center, the main sponsor on the most iconic Canadian TV show. The Saturday headlines presented by Huawei smartphones. Huawei was already a global telecom leader. It was on track to build and supply Canada's next generation of 5G technology. But there were deep concerns about a company so close to the inner workings of the Communist Party routing and connecting your phone calls and internet connections. It's become sort of a global joke. China spies on everyone. Those concerns only deepened when Meng Wanzhou was arrested in Vancouver and the two Michaels were rounded up in China. With that resolved, many are waiting for Canada to make a final decision, banning Huawei from building cell infrastructure here. It clears the deck for the Canadian government to take a step back and rethink Huawei. Huawei emerges from this dispute a diminished company. It posted its first ever quarterly loss this month. Huawei says the company will push ahead. Huawei will never give up the smartphone business. But remember, China's not just trying to expand its economy, it's trying to push it into maturity, to go from being a global factory to tech leader, and Huawei is key to that. 
Meanwhile, the Chinese economy is expanding everywhere in spite of the diplomatic and trade disputes these past years. Last year, uh, Canada-China trade actually have increased despite the uh, trade volume for Canada with other countries uh, has been decreasing. So the big question is, what's next? Experts say the next years will be marked by growing concerns among Western nations like Canada, matched only by growing ambition out of China. And rest assured, Huawei will be a part of both the concern and the ambition. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. The impact of social media on children is a concern for many parents. Worries Facebook says it hears. The company says its plans for an Instagram for kids is on hold. Tanya Fletcher looks at why parents and experts have raised alarm bells. Almost far enough. <laughs> For Carly Parkinson and her two kids, screen time has become a matter of life. So too has social media. Well, there's no avoiding it. It's going to happen. Her son Oliver recently joined Messenger Kids, an app with parental oversight. Just typing to my friends or seeing if they can play. Oliver's age group is the direct target market for the new Instagram for kids designed for 10 to 12 year olds, but. I don't really see how Instagram would fit with their daily life and then they're, unless they're just taking pictures of themselves and posting it, but then it goes into do people want their children to be sharing images of themselves. Now, Instagram owner Facebook says it's putting a pause on the platform to address those kinds of concerns. I still strongly believe that it's the right thing to do to give parents the option to give their tweens a version of Instagram that was designed with them in mind. YouTube and TikTok have already put out kids' versions, but some experts say there's a difference with Instagram. It's a social media where the whole purpose is to display the self for the approval of others, and I don't see how younger children are in any way able to manage the sort of social and emotional demands of that. Other experts point out the technology behind these kinds of apps is ultimately designed to boost a bottom line. Making it much easier for these companies to target kids, to profile them, to collect the data. And in the future, that makes it much easier to advertise to kids directly or sell data about children. Meanwhile, for Carly, it's key the company take all of these concerns into consideration. Maybe they will add some extra security or extra features so that parents do have a little more control, especially over that age group. I do like the filters. Because for her kids, using social media is no longer an if, but a when. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Some university parties got out of hand in London, Ontario this weekend. Six people were sent to hospital with critical injuries during parties near Western University. Students were seen hanging off of street signs and jumping off roofs. Paramedics and police responded to dozens of calls. Police say there were about 2,000 people partying in areas around campus. And a similar scene near Dalhousie University this weekend. Now the school is urging students who attended large street parties to stay home this week and get tested for COVID-19. Hundreds of students were seen partying on the streets near campus. Dalhousie condemned the gatherings, calling them reckless and illegal. The university is considering further steps, including disciplinary action. R. Kelly, once an R&B superstar, is now a convicted sex offender. Found guilty of nine charges, including racketeering and sex trafficking. Eli Glasner shows us it took public attention and bravery from victims to crack Kelly's shell of impunity. Through the years, Robert Kelly always maintained his innocence. Um, I promise you we're going to straighten all of this stuff out. That's all I can say right now. When confronted by journalists, he would leave. No video questions for me because this interview is over. Or protest. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this But after five weeks, accusations from nine women, two men and dozens of witnesses, there was no place to hide. The jury found him guilty. This time, Kelly stayed silent. Outside, his defense complained. I don't know if I'm more disappointed in the jury's verdict or the government's action in this case. Once a beloved R&B superstar, R. Kelly has always had his defenders, so many that a movement was created to give voice to his accusers. Mute R. Kelly! Mute R. Kelly! 
This is truly a win for survivors. The co-founder says the trial showed how R. Kelly's network of managers and employees silenced his victims. The thing that was not surprising to me but was really sad to me was the degree to which these young people were just used and thrown away and marginalized. This journalist says it never should have taken this long. It is a tragedy that the city of Chicago and America in general is going to have to parse that none of these young women, these women of color, and I think race is key to this, were believed for 30 years while this guy is in the full spotlight, the brightest spotlight of popular music. But the victim's voices in a documentary series started to turn the tide. I just like you to know that you really hurt me. I was a little girl and like, a bad man's world. I never really recovered from it. In court, the jury heard the lurid ways Kelly abused underage victims, forcing them to call him daddy and threatening them with punishments. Kelly could face a lifetime in jail and is still awaiting trial for other sex crimes in Illinois and Minnesota. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Drivers across the UK are desperate to fill their tanks as gas stations are running out of fuel. Get the gas at the central London is a mission impossible. Up next, what is driving the shortage and why the military could soon get involved? Is it the moment to rethink how we buy and sell real estate? Why some say it is time to end blind bidding? We felt duped and manipulated. And the lost recordings of John Lennon and a Canadian journalist. What Beatle music do you look upon as being outstanding? Well, I'm prejudiced. I like my own. You know. The revealing conversations found tucked away in a basement. We're back in two. But let me be clear. Boosters are important. But the most important thing we need to do is get more people vaccinated. Well, that is U.S. President Joe Biden clearly urging Americans to get vaccinated just moments after receiving his third shot on live TV. At 78 years old, Biden qualified for the additional shot under new guidance issued last week by the Food and Drug Administration. I know that looks confusing, but that is French President Emmanuel Macron being pelted by an egg today while visiting a restaurant and hotel trade fair in Lyon. Fortunately for him, it didn't break on Macron, but instead burst on the floor. The person who threw the egg was quickly removed from the room. <laughs> and subdued celebrations in Germany today for Social Democrats leader Olaf Scholz after his party claimed victory in the federal election. It narrowly beat out outgoing <laughs> Chancellor Angela Merkel's Christian Democratic Union. Scholz will now commence coalition negotiations, which could take months. If high gas prices have been worrying you, well, consider this. At least Canadians can still get fuel. In Britain, many gas pumps across the country have run dry. And stations that do have it have been limiting how much drivers can buy. The CBC's Chris Brown spent the day with some frustrated motorists. If you've got somewhere to go in the UK, best not use a car to get there. Our taxi driver told us it took him three hours to fill up this morning. To get the gas at the central London is a mission impossible. The problem, says the Conservative government, isn't a lack of fuel. It's a lack of transport truck drivers to deliver it and a lot of panic buying. I think the government knew beforehand and they should have got, you know, information, you know, so maybe some bring the army in or something, you know. That's no joke. Using military trucks to distribute fuel is apparently still an option of last resort. So a lot of the drivers in this queue are going to be pretty disappointed when they finally get up to the pumps. They've just said that they are now out of regular gasoline here, only diesel. And that's a pretty standard story at most gas stations now across the UK. We met a woman who came searching for an open gas station on her bicycle. Is it Brexit? Totally. Of course it is. There's nothing, like, they can hide behind COVID all they want, but it's, it's definitely Brexit. Many here believe when Britain left the EU, a lot of workers, including truck drivers, went home to Europe to avoid hassles and new ones couldn't get trained because of the pandemic. So the government has announced an emergency visa scheme to hire some back. But the association representing gas station owners fears it's a short-term fix. 
it does relate back to almost a perfect storm when you had um, Brexit, you had COVID, you had uh, changes to the rules on self-employment. And it's not just the gas sector suffering the supply chain woes. Supermarket shelves have been going bare in some places as other supplies were disrupted too. The most important thing everyone can do uh, is just get back to normal, fill their cars up as they normally would uh, and not buy petrol unless they need it. One unintended consequence of all this, there's never been a better time to own an electric car. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. As the price of a home in this country keeps rising, there are calls to change how we buy and sell. So how much over listing were you advised to bid then? A couple hundred thousand. Is there a better way to bid on a home? Would knowing what others are offering help lower prices? And the rediscovered recordings of John Lennon, the revealing conversations, including his favorite Beatles songs, a little later. As home prices continue to rise across Canada, so does frustration among many buyers. Some think they are losing out on bid after bid because of a system that is working against them. Peter Armstrong looks at why some believe it is time to take the secrecy out of the bidding process. This townhome is getting ready for sale. And so far, it's a familiar scene. Stagers prep the place. Home inspectors look for trouble. The photographer waits for just the right light, but there's one major difference about the sale of this home. This property is going to be going up for an open auction, um, which is, for all intents and purposes, the same as what people are used to, with the one big difference being that all the bids are transparent. So this okay. has been a transformation already. Real estate agent Daniel Steinfeld is an industry veteran, but a few years ago he started questioning the status quo. The rule in organized real estate in Ontario is that the real estate profession can't let anybody else know what other people are bidding. Good morning. So he decided to get around the system by becoming an auctioneer. I am co-founder and broker from On The Block Realty and On The Block Auctions. This is where the auction itself will take place. You're able to see what the current price is and when any other bids or offers come in, you know how high you need to go. Seinfeld's not the only one who's been thinking about this issue. It's not fair that issues like blind bidding uh, are so heartbreaking uh, for so many families. This past election, the Liberals made a ban on blind bidding part of their housing platform, promising more affordability and more transparency. But what would an end to blind bidding look like? We're going to dig a little deeper, starting with the issue of affordability. How difficult is it to really get into what matters and how this all works when it's such an emotional thing. It is an emotional thing, buying and Ortaza Haider is a researcher of data science and real estate. He says our housing market is so, yes, in crisis. On a per capita basis, we are building half as many homes now as we were building in the early 70s. But a ban on blind bidding could help. When a house sells via blind bidding, a hopeful buyer could unknowingly bid tens of thousands more than the second highest bidder and push up the price for the entire surrounding neighborhood. And by removing it, you could just take that extra little heat out of every little market across the country. Absolutely, so you will remove a higher volatility. It, it will, you will add more stability in the market. My daughter put this video together. Jeannie Park's on board with the idea of more transparency. So this is a video of the exterior of the oh, cottage. Wow. You guys out on the lake? That, those are my kids, those are my girls. This spring, Jeannie and her family went hunting for a cottage, just like throngs of others looking to escape the city. There were a lot of properties we were interested in. Unfortunately, we got outbid. They'd already lost four blind bidding wars, so weren't surprised when their agent told them they'll be competing on this cottage too. So how much over listing were you advised to bid that night? A couple hundred thousand over list. And, uh, and we just went a little bit over just because we wanted to get that property. Turned out there were no other bids. We felt duped and manipulated. Um, the fact that there were zero registered offers, um, that we were misled with false information uh, in order for us to put in our top price. You paid 230000 more than you felt you should have. 
I think is just mind-boggling. I know, I know. We're having to pay for for this while she gets a big fat paycheck. Jeannie filed a complaint with Ontario's real estate regulator. I do have footage where she does admit to uh, another registered offer. She even submitted a recording she believes proves her case. Two offers, she says. I believe the offer. 333. You believe the offer was 333? I don't have the information in front of you. I'll have to ask. We reached out to the realtor as well, but she won't comment while the investigation is open. So even if this investigation finds in your favor, what happens? Well, they're not going to reduce the price that we paid for, and they're certainly not going to pay for my mortgage. And uh, I think there's, there's little that's going to be done against this agent. Do you think blind bidding should be banned outright? Absolutely, 100%. And she's not alone. A poll by CBC found the majority of Canadians want a ban on blind bidding. Less than a quarter support the status quo. David, thank you for doing this. Really the real estate industry is pushing back. The seller, who is the homeowner, uh, should uh, have, that, ha have that right to decide uh, how they want to sell. David Oikel leads the Ontario Real Estate Association. To what extent is it, in fact, rigged in the favour of the sellers against the buyer? We're in a, 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 certainly in a seller's market, but it needs to be uh, something that is uh, important uh, you know, in, in all markets, in all circumstances. Besides, he says, this proposal would barely address affordability. Australia and New Zealand have, uh, have auctions. Prices have gone up uh, there because, you know, auction fever. I don't think this is addresses a problem and, and creates additional ones. We've got a beautiful day for an auction here. Let's get the show on the road. In Australia, bidding wars are fully transparent. Right out on the street transparent, where houses are sold in open auctions. You better be the one holding that very last bid. But just like here in Canada, Australian home prices are way up this year. 520. What? I think that that's going off of a very narrow-sighted view of what auctions are and how they operate. At 920, 40 I have now. 60, can I make it, sir? That high emotion, looking at people bidding against you and maybe doing things that are outside of your means is not the model that we have. Uh, it's an online model. It allows people to do their research for days or weeks ahead of time. And when auction night comes, it's all in front of them at the click of a button. So the auction has just now opened. All the bidders have pre-registered. Now they've logged in and we're all just waiting for the first bid to come in. And we now have one bid, $1,000 over asking. And now everybody else has to just wait and see how they'll react, what happens to the price going from here. And unlike Australia, none of the bidders can actually see who the others are. Why can't you just say, yeah, sure. You want to sell your house that way and these people want to buy it that way. We're going to help facilitate it and we'll take our cut and, and everybody can be happy. The consumer gets to decide if they want to sell it with or without representation. Bottom line, if you want transparent bidding, you'll have to choose to do it without a traditional realtor. But when you break it down, the choice may not be so clear. In Ontario alone, there are more than 80,000 real estate agents who only sell via blind bidding, but only a couple of auction houses focused on real estate. For Hyder, the answer is simple. I think the best thing is to go back to the provincial regulators and say, is your current practice guaranteeing fairness, protecting the rights of sellers and buyers alike? But if it's not, then let's build transparency and trust, because that's what the industry relies on. And as always, it relies on bringing buyers and sellers together, whether in a heated bidding war or not. Okay, so the clock's run out, but we only had that one bid come in. So now everything defaults to a more traditional sale between the buyer and the homeowner. So even with a more transparent process, the house sold, buyer and seller are happy. And at the end of the day, Daniel still got to hang one of these. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. As India braces for a new wave of COVID-19, many are still reeling in the aftermath of the last one. I ended up spending 90 days in the ICU. 
When we come back, the lingering damage for families in that country and the fear of what could come next. Dramatic lava eruptions are back today on the Spanish island of La Palma after a period of relative calm over the weekend. Officials say the volcano has entered a phase of what's called lower activity more than a week after the eruptions first began. Now, India has come a long way since its devastating second wave of COVID-19 earlier this year. New cases are a fraction of those during the spring peak. Hundreds of thousands died then. Millions more found themselves in crushing medical debt. And a health care system was in tatters. Now there are growing fears of what a third wave will do to an exhausted country. Here's Salima Shibji. The frustration barrels through the bullhorn. These community health workers are weary after months on the front lines, underpaid and underappreciated. COVID hit hard and we were working triple time helping patients, she says, with no extra pay, left vulnerable. Suman Walhara caught the virus at work in India's first wave and is still suffering, struggling to breathe. With a family to help support, she has no choice but to work through the pain. I have to live with it, she says. I take painkillers to make it through every workday. Neelam Jaiswal is also living with the after effects of a severe case of COVID-19. She's home from hospital now, but spends most days in bed hooked up to oxygen. I'm feeling better, she says, but still weak and anxious. The emotional toll is hitting her husband, too. He can't bear to think of where they were a few months ago, the scramble to find a hospital bed and oxygen for his wife. I was crying at home alone. When I was alone, I cry. What to do? How I can save her? These days, the worry is over her recovery, getting his wife the right pills, booking her hospital tests as the medical bills pile up. You don't have insurance? No, I don't have any insurance at that time. Uh, totally cost more than 25 lakh. Pushing $50,000 and counting. Still going on. Medicines are going on, tests are going on right now. The sheer scale of India's second wave of the pandemic means many are in a similar position. Malni Prasad checks her oxygen levels over and over. She's adjusting to life confined to her home, trying to get her energy levels up. I ended up spending 90 days in the ICU, which is like one of the longest tenure one could undergo. It's a dramatic shift from a healthy young mother in her early 40s to a woman fighting to get back to normal, unable to work. The scars of India's brutal second wave are also still fresh at this New Delhi hospital. In April, this ICU was overflowing with patients packed in everywhere all gasping for breath. It's another couple of hours, so we are struggling. Dr. Are Sumit struggling. Ray, head of critical care, was constantly on his phone, begging for more oxygen that was fast running out. We were working nonstop, and in spite of that, there was not enough time. And it was for a, a sustained period of 50, time. 50 days, uh, I keep telling, 50 days of hell, absolute hell. Today, there are only two COVID-19 patients, down from a high of 400. The hospital, like many others, has a new stash of extra ventilators. It's massively increased its supply of oxygen and is getting a new liquid oxygen generating plant to avoid a shortage next time. Mirroring the Indian government's push to double the country's production of medical oxygen ahead of a third wave looming this fall. So I'm hopeful that it won't be as bad, the third phase, but we have to always be alert to the fact that it possibly can. Alert and prepared, bracing for whatever may come with the next wave. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Delhi. Next on The National, the once forgotten conversations with John Lennon. What Beatle music do you look upon as being outstanding? Well, I'm prejudiced. I like my own. <laughs> the newly rediscovered like tapes found nine. tucked away in a basement right after the break.
it is, a musical masterpiece by the late John Lennon. The song, Imagine, was released 50 years ago this month, and it still endures as a much beloved message of hope. Both as a solo artist and as part of the Beatles, Lennon was the voice of a generation still missed. Now a rare opportunity to hear him again. After a set of long forgotten interviews with a Canadian journalist was rediscovered. Karen Pauls has our story. These 12 reel-to-reel -reel tapes are going up for auction tomorrow in the UK. 90 minutes of candid conversations with John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Our only worry in the world That's, is that we yes. die together at exactly the same minute, otherwise, even yeah. if it's three minutes later, it's going to be hell. They were recorded in 1969 and 70 by Winnipeg journalist Ken Zelig, who was working in London for the CBC and the BBC. What Beatle music do you look upon as being outstanding? Well, I'm prejudiced. I like my own. <laughs> I like Revolution Number 9. Name other favourites from the 60s. Walrus, Strawberry Fields, Day in the Life. Zelig interviewed Lennon and Ono as newlyweds soon after their bed-in peace protest in Montreal. Who was paying for the War is Over campaign? <laughs> Bag Productions, and that's John and Yoko. Zelig died in Winnipeg in 1990 and left his children trunks filled with his work. But it wasn't until the pandemic lockdowns that one of his daughters found the recordings. This incredible archive, this treasure trove, of interviews um, was just gathering dust. His son Leo says what struck him most was a discussion about Lennon's recently released wedding album. I want to interject a, a bit of a personal note here because my wife and I listened to the record together sitting uh, in opposite chairs and uh, midway we looked at each other and she came over to me and we hugged each other that's while we were listening to it. That's beautiful. Which really happened, I must say. Oh, that's, that's fantastic beautiful. and that's what it's that's about, great. you know. That's all it. musical yeah. beats, you know, all the beats in the music, you know, is the extension of your heartbeat. That is incredibly special. And of course, to hear it about your parents, you know, in, in an interview with John Lennon and Yoko Ono is extraordinary. The cash of tapes is expected to sell for as much as $53,000. The auctioneer told us of another great moment. He talks about his hair as well and how long his hair is in um, 1969 and people are you know, calling him out for it. He says in 1984, they'll probably be wearing hair like I've got and, you know, I'll be bald at that point. So, he, yeah, he, he makes a few nice quirky comments as well. Ken Zelig's family hopes to digitize some of the other interviews he's done with legends like Audrey Hepburn and Alfred Hitchcock. Imagine hearing some of those voices from the past. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. So cool. A BC man found himself with some time on his hands early on in the pandemic. When I saw these, uh, what I thought were really beautiful cedar strip canoes on Facebook Marketplace. That inspiration led him to build a canoe using wood from an unexpected source. That's next. Plenty of people have picked up pandemic projects over the past year and a half, including a piano technician from British Columbia who turned three pianos destined for the dump into one canoe. So 15 months later, after hundreds of hours spent in his workshop, George Klassen and his family tested that canoe in the water for the first time, and that's our moment. It's floating. I can't believe it. When I saw these, uh, what I thought were really beautiful cedar strip canoes on Facebook Marketplace, and the artistry got to me, you know. Every day, uh, old pianos are just going to the dump. Nobody wants them. They take up a lot of room. I just wondered whether it would be possible to use the wood and mill them into strips. And so I went to YouTube, where everybody goes to get educated. And uh, I thought, you know what? I could do this. I was surprised when I started making strips out of these old pianos how beautiful the wood was. I enjoy the unconventional part of it. And I saved three pianos from going to the dump, which is a bonus. My dad's always been, uh, for lack of a better term, a tinkerer. He's always able to fix things with whatever's laying around. Well, we're joking that this is now the family yacht, like it'll be kind of passed down from generation to generation. 
Okay, Sun calls him a tinkerer. I think he's an artist. Um, and aside from the, the fiberglass shell, everything, almost everything on there is from the piano. The ivory keys, the wooden handle, the sound boards. It floats, it floats well, a few adjustments. But other than that, he's super happy. That is a national for September 27th, tonight.